God above anything we've been taught, above any of our traditions, above any of the things. We always want to make sure we know it is true and we conform to it. We don't take it down and lower it and conform it to us. That's very important in the life of a believer. The Bible, you know, is very clear. And, and you know, the truth is, if you don't know what you believe, then you're liable to fall for anything. So let's look for the truth in the Word of God. It contains the truth. The Holy Spirit, as Paul says, is our teacher in all truth. So we want to know as believers that we are being instructed by the Holy Spirit that the Word of God is the true plumb line or level for a believer and that the Holy Spirit will lead us and teach us into all truth. Okay? as it applies to the Word of God. I can promise you when you feel like you've heard from the Lord, if you can take what you feel like the Lord has told you or showed you or instructed you to do, and you take it to the Bible and it lines up, chances are that was the Word of God to you. So, you know, it's very difficult for us to, you know, realize that when we think, oh, hey, you know, Brooke, I felt like the Lord told me this. What do you think? Oh, hey, Mikhail, I feel like the Lord told me this. What, what do you think? And the whole time, we leave the one truth that we have in our life out of the equation. That's a problem. And that's how believers, we make mistakes and and things like that. Now, it's good to confirm with your brothers and sisters in Christ, but the Bible, it is the plumb line. So we're going to continue that line of thought. One of the questions, and I saved this to this week because it's the week before Christmas, and some of you probably are not going to like my answer, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I could spend months, literally months, scripturally going through, and I could, and I could probably uh, give either point of view from a scriptural standpoint for this question. The question was, if Jesus was born in August, so there's an assumption, right? The assumption is that he was born in August. So why do we celebrate in December? Well, first of all, Remember that if he was born in August is an assumption. So what, what we really would do is we'd want to see what the scripture says. And so I really, I really did a great deal of research into this. But I, I'll tell you what conclusions I came to. First of all, an important point to understand is that the Hebrew calendar is lunar in nature. In other words, they didn't follow what we consider the Julian calendar, which is 30 or 31 days, right? Except February is 28, right? They followed the moon cycles. It's called a lunar, a lunar calendar, and it follows the lunar cycles of the moon. So each year is approximately 12.4 months, okay? And so... It would be difficult for you and I to go, well, it was December 25th when you have a year that's 12.4 months. You know, we, we could, we, you see how the, the, the dates could be mistaken. So we, you know, if you really, if it really is important to you to know the exact day that Christ was born, I think you have to look at things that are evident in scripture. Uh, I've been to Israel. Has anybody been to Israel in winter? Uh, It snows in Israel in the winter just like it does here. I was there in December, and in December there was snow on the ground. Well, we know that shepherds were out in the field with their sheep. How many of us as cattlemen or or sheep people are out in the fields with our sheep in the winter? Right? That's not where we're usually at. We're usually, they're out grazing, we're somewhere else where it's warm, right? And it's no different there. Or they've been brought in closer where we don't have to be out into the range, right? So there are, there are things of that nature, but to get into them honestly, honestly, there's no way I could answer this question, honestly, satisfactorily to everybody. But the truth is it would take weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks of us going through the scripture diligently, and we would still at the end of the day not be sure. Now, why do you think that is? That's exactly right. Is, is the importance the day he was born, or is the importance that he was born? He was born, born, right? Is the importance on the the time of year he was born, or in the way in which he was born? He was conceived by a virgin. So does it matter if it was, you know, we're looking at August, or it was March, or it was December 25th? No, no, no. Do, Do you understand? A woman who had known no man had a child because she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. 
August, March, December, what? Are we really getting the point? You see what I'm saying? So now the truth is there are some very good thoughts on what we have. There's actually two major line of thoughts. I only said those things to get you to focus on what we're talking about, which is the fact that God became flesh, Amen. right? The creator of the universe came down and took on a body like you and I for a reason. But back to the question, if Jesus was born in August, why do we celebrate in December? All right, we talked about the lunar calendar. There's 12.4 days. Actually, there are two major lines of thought. The traditional, which is what, it's traditional because we call it traditional. Actually, it's traditional because it was established in 336 AD by Rome when the Catholic Church began. And what they did really is they took a pagan holiday and you know, they were trying to get rid of all their paganism. And they said, okay, well, since this was the holiday of the worship of the sun god, you know, well, then we're going to make this the birthday of Christ. That's where the December 25th came from, okay? So it's just a matter of, you know, realizing that it's not about it being December 25th or March or August or, you know. Uh, but anyway, so the traditional mind, uh, and, and there is, and there is, there is, there is uh, some understanding that, that December is a possibility uh, when you get into... Uh, uh, Matthew and Luke, and it describes what was going on, uh, that John the Baptist's father, remember, he was in the temple. It gives a description of he served in his order. order. If you go back and look at the Jewish calendar, as the eighth order of the service for the Levitical tribe. So you can trace that back to that year. It would have been this time frame from June to, you know, so you can do that. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, when did Mary meet Elizabeth, where, who was pregnant with John the Baptist, that when he came into, when she came into the room, John the Baptist leapt within the womb of, or, uh, within the womb of Elizabeth, right, his mother? And, and, and uh, you know, how, Mary was already with child. Well, how far along was Elizabeth? And, and there is scripture that tells us that it was probably about six months when Elizabeth, you know, and about three months later, then, then the Lord came. Well, when was John born? See, so you see how this could just go and go and go. And, you know, there's, when you start researching it in, in the Hebrew, then you have a lot of the tradition that comes in to play. Well, in that year, it would have been the eighth order of, and, you know, it would have been this date and this time frame. So we want to make sure that we understand that traditional, uh, one view is the traditional and the second view is called Tishiri, which is more of a early spring uh, time frame for the birth of Christ, a March type time frame. OK. Um, uh, and these are and there are early church fathers from the first century uh, that claim a late December birth. Uh, I, I was looking at some of them, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people like to call the early church father hippopotamus. It's not hippopotamus. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, he was one of the early church fathers. And, and you know, there are others that claimed a, a late December birth for the Lord Jesus. OK, in the first century A.D. But we know for a fact now I said late December, not December 25th. But in 326 A.D., uh, it was declared by the Roman Catholic Church the 25th of December to be the birth of Jesus Christ in order to replace the pagan holiday uh, Saturnalia, which was the worship of the sun god. OK, that's where the December 25th and the tr Western tradition uh, came from. And oh, man, you can't worship Christmas. The, the, the Catholics did. Come on. Remember what we're doing. We are re re just like when you take the Lord's elements, right? We take the bread and we take the wine and we do it. Why? In remembrance of him until he comes. Why do we celebrate Christmas? In remembrance of him and his coming to earth to save a lost and dying world. What day it is is of no importance in the view of who he is and what he did. Okay? Um, I told you not all of you are going to be happy with my answers. But uh, I just couldn't, I could have spent months researching this, and, and you still would not have been satisfied because truly the Bible just doesn't declare that it was a particular day. Okay, they give times and seasons, and so we have an idea, but it doesn't give the importance, uh, it doesn't put the importance on December 25th. So that's something that we have done 
Uh, we, when we, I say believers, you know, even as far back as the first century. In light of these uncertainties, it is perhaps uh, advisable to take a humble attitude and confess our ignorance in the matter, because that's just the truth of it. You can ask me, preacher, was it December 25th or August or was it March? I honestly don't know. And, and I did some deep research. Jewish, uh, 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 in the Hebrew language research, research of uh, the traditions of the early fathers in the first century, uh, research into the, uh, the uh, 326 AD from Catholicism, you know, why they did that, what the Septuagint said, what the, what the received text or the uh, Texas Receptus said, you know, it, it just, none of it gave a clear definitive date. And so I guess exactly as Elaine said, then the Lord just did not put the emphasis on that date. The, the Lord put the emphasis on the event, Amen. right? And not the date. So I want to uh, uh, reiterate the important thing, of course, is that our Lord was indeed born and ransomed us, right? From the wages of our sins. <clears throat> now, this is what I would like you to do anytime that uh, you're, coming to these things that, well, I don't necessarily agree. And, you know, I'm not real sure. I, I want you to think of this. Uh, um, Augustine of Hippo is one of the early church fathers. And he said, in necessarilis unitas, in dublius libertas, in omnibus autem caritas. And this is what it means. In essentials, unity. What's our essential? The blood, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, right? Freedom, grace, our, for, our sins are forgiven once forever. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. We believe the testimony that God gave of his son, right? And so therefore we have life, right? Those are essentials. Notice I didn't mention baptism. I didn't mention the Lord's Supper. I didn't mention speaking in tongues. I didn't mention what day Christmas is on. I didn't mention, right? Because those aren't essentials. Essentials. Are, are you my brother or sister in Christ? And if you are my brother and sister in Christ, now I have direction. And that direction is, I'm to love you as Christ loved you. Amen. Oh, but preacher, I, I'm, I just love people how I would love them. Well, how'd you like Jesus to love you that way? <laughs> right? So there's our, there's our unity. When we are one in Christ, our direction, unequivocal love for one another as Christ loved us. Okay? So the next one is in doubtful things, liberty. How many of you agree with me all the time? Every hand in here should go up. Nope, not a single hand. You know why? Because the truth is we are different human beings. The Holy Spirit has got me where I am. The Holy Spirit has got you where you are. How many of you agree with me that Jesus Christ came to earth, died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day? Ooh, Every hand in here is raised. Okay? There we have unity. And the rest of the things, what you do is you give me liberty as I give you liberty. And the liberty is not for me to control what you're doing, but for the Holy Spirit. You to have the freedom that the Holy Spirit moves on you and tells and reveals all truth to you. And so you're not a little Mark walking around. Or I'm not a little Elaine or, or, or a little uh, Wayne or, you know, we are individuals. And God wants us to be individuals because we cannot all be the body. We can't all be the foot. We can't all be the hand. That'd be an awful small body, wouldn't it? Yep. Can't all be the eye. God gives us gifts individually as he sees fit, okay? <laughs> and then omnibus autem caritas, which is but in all things love. Whether it's unity, whether it's difference. For us to respond any other way. We haven't even got into the message yet. For us, to respond in, for us to respond in any other way than love, it would be displeasing to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our response to everything should be love. Amen. Oh, did you see what Wayne did? Good Lord. My response is love. Amen. Your response is his brother or sister in Christ is love. Did you see what Millie did? Good gracious, you should have heard her in the post office. <laughs> My response... My response should always be that that is my sister in Christ. And so she gets my unbridled love, just like Jesus Christ loves her. So we just need to remember who we are in Christ, right? All right, now we're going to start the message. So what does the, we already talked about what the Bible doesn't tell us about the birth of Christ. So now let's talk about what the Bible does tell us about the birth of Christ. 
First of all, that he was born of a virgin. Do you see how the emphasis can be misplaced when we talk about whether, and hey, it was a great question. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, but you see, we kind of focus on, well, that store doesn't say Christmas. I'm not going there. Serious? Well, where are you going to get your biscuits? <laughs> you got to go somewhere to get your biscuits. Well, they said happy holidays to me. You know what? And it is a shame that we've removed Christmas and Christ from Christmas. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If he can't be removed from you, he ain't been removed from nowhere. Amen. 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 So let's talk about what is and not what's not. Okay. He was born of a virgin. So let's, let's talk about the occasion or the method in which he was born. Do you realize that God took a woman who had never known a man? She was a young maiden, a virgin. And even back in Isaiah, hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus came, even far, as far back as Genesis 3.15, yep. we see the Lord prophesied. But in Isaiah 7.14, he prophesies, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, speaking of Israel, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We just sang a song. What does Emmanuel mean? God with, us. God with us. Whoever tells you Jesus Christ was not God in the flesh does not know the word of God. God beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Lord Jesus himself claims to be God and God himself claims Jesus Christ to be God. He was every bit as much God on the earth as he was God in heaven. Anytime in the Bible you see a physical appearance uh, it says, Angel of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It is a physical appearance Amen. of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews tells us that he is the express image Amen. of God the Father. Right. An express image is like if you took one of those ten types, and you know they used to press it over a thing and it would leave the image. Jesus Christ was the physical appearance of God the Father. Amen. He was the express image of of God. Okay. Matthew 1 23 says a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God is with us to a virgin. Don't ever let anybody attack the virgin birth. This, this, the, the, the Greek word here where it says a young maiden, it, it, it's not referring to a young maiden as in it's talking about a young maiden that was below the age of 13. Okay. So a young maiden that's below the age of 13, you know what happened in Jerusalem? If, if you were, if you were, uh, were un, unpure as, as, a, as a young woman, uh, and you were stoned to death. This isn't a, a, a play on words where somebody can doubt the virgin birth. She was indeed a virgin. And it says in, in the Bible that she was a spouse to a man who, whose name was Joseph of the, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, something that's always interesting to me, if you'll look in Matthew chapter 1, it'll show the lineage of Jesus Christ through his, his, uh, his half-father, David. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ had the right to sit on the earthly throne of King David. He was of the house of David, who the Lord said his throne would never end. Okay? On Mary's side, it shows her seed coming down uh, and, and, and the Lord Jesus' uh, uh, right to sit on the throne through another son of King David. Both Joseph and Mary were of the house of David. Both had the right in their family lineage to sit upon the throne of David, which comes very, very important in the last days because he will indeed sit upon that throne. And that throne will never end, and it will never cease. So read those lineages. I think it's uh, Luke, uh, um, it's Matthew chapter 1, and I think it's Luke chapter 3 of, of Jesus through see? Mary. But if you will look at those and look at the, dip, I'll tell you something that always blesses my heart. Do you know that when uh, uh, Solomon was the child of who? Does anybody know who Solomon's parents were? David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Do you remember who Bathsheba was? She was the one that David stole from Uriah the Hittite. The other woman. No, she was not the other woman. He was the other man. He actually went and took her, That's right. is what the Bible says. 
But their first child, remember I taught about this, that the first child died and, and David had been mourning and his servants were all racked out because they didn't understand what the deal was with him. This is in our first, is that really in the Bible? Okay, well, Solomon was their second child. And Solomon, through Solomon's line, we see uh, Rachel, we see Obed, we see, uh, I, you should read it and see God was using people who by all rights, was Bathsheba a Jew? Fifty-fifty. Fifty-fifty. <laughs> well, the truth is, is, is all we know is that Uriah was a Hittite. All we know is that Uriah was a Hittite. But the, the, the point is, is that the Lord shows that lineage all the way down to the Lord Jesus Christ through, through Bathsheba. Very interesting that God would take something outside and move it inside and produce through it the very, the very Savior of the world. Sound familiar to you? Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, but you who were far from God, without hope. Ephesians chapter 2, but now you have been drawn near by the blood of Jesus Christ. He took something that was outside and he drew us near, and we are now called the what? Sons and daughters sharing an inheritance of God's. Do you see? Even in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he took something from outside, brought it inside, too. And, and, and then through it, produced the Savior to the world. Do you know who is, who is the physical image of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth today? the body. He took something from the outside, brought it to the inside, and through it is using it to save the world through the body of Jesus Christ. Listen, you are the hands and you are the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to hear and see Jesus Christ in you and you alone because the Lord Jesus Christ, we know, according to Hebrews, is seated where? At the right hand of the Father. So you and I are what he has left here in order, to, as Paul describes it, to reconcile this world to God through the body of Christ. He calls it the ministry of reconciliation. Let's keep going. So he was born of a virgin. Two, he was God in the flesh. John chapter 1, verses 4 through 4. In the beginning was the Word. I want you to always keep that in your mind. We were talking earlier about what's our standard? The Word of God. This is a description of Jesus Christ. They call him the Word. Okay, keep reading. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hold on a second. If the Word is describing Jesus Christ, it just called him what? Just called him God. Don't let anybody tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ is not God. He is every bit God as God the Father is God. Amen. And he is every bit God as the Holy Spirit is God. Okay? And don't let them tell you the Bible doesn't say that. It says it right there. And the Word was God. The same, the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, speaking of the Word. Okay, so Genesis chapter 1, when the Spirit of God hovered above the waters of the earth, and He began to create things, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, who does this say it was? Jesus Christ. We were talking about the Word. It says... Uh, in verse 3, all things were made by him, speaking of the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. The stars in heaven, the earth, the human being, the animals, the plant life, it was all Jesus Christ. Don't ever let anybody tell you he was not God in the flesh. In him was life and the life was the light of men. John 1, 9 through 10. That, speaking of Jesus Christ, was the true light, <coughs> which lighteth every man that comes into the world. How many men? Every man. See, the, 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 the light of truth contained in Jesus Christ that occurred at his birth is visible to every human being. Read Romans chapter 1. We've studied that before. God says that he has made it known to the created thing that he is the creator. That in the very creation they can see the Godhead. And then he says, but they have chosen to worship the created thing rather than the creator. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
So don't be mis, uh, misled that, that a human being does not know there's a God. Oh, yes, they do. It is very in their very fibers of who they are. Now, they may worship the sun. They may worship the tree. They may worship Buddha. They may worship Muhammad. But they know they're supposed to worship something. And if all else fails, they worship who? Themselves. Right? We call them atheists or uh, you know, agnostics, you know, where they believe that self is above everything else. Well, they've just chosen to worship themselves instead of a beast or an idol. John 14, 1 14, and the word was made flesh. Now we've already identified in verses one through four that the word was who? God. The word was God. And verse 14 says, and the word who we already know is God was made flesh. Speaking of Jesus Christ, he was the physical manifestation of God on the earth. You know why? When God in Hebrews, it tells us that God, because um, there was none higher, he did what? He made an oath to himself. So God told God, you know what? You're going to have to go down. You have to give yourself up. John tells us uh, uh, that, that, that Jesus Christ knew that he would give his life for the world. And so God had a conversation with himself and praise God he did because what he did in the process when he made an oath to himself is he removed you and I from the covenant. We no longer had a law to observe. Praise God. Because clearly we can see by our brothers and sisters in, in, in the nation of Israel how miserable they were and continually failing before. And, and they missed the whole point of the law was always to show the, their, their need of God. It was always to show them that their need of, uh, to love God above anything else they were doing. And so God made an oath with himself since there was none higher and he removed, he removed us from that oath. And since he made that oath, he came down and he took on flesh, knowing from the moment he took on flesh, knowing from the moment he took on flesh that he would be dying for every human being on the planet. Past, present, and future. Amen. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. No, no law in there. Amen. No law in there, full of grace and truth. Now this, even this is, is to the nation Israel. So he was even telling the nation Israel law, uh, uh, truth and grace. Okay. And of his fullness, we uh, have, have we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He was God in the flesh. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God who at sundry times just means different times and in different manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Remember we called John called him the word. All right. He has spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, uh, the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Amen. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Jesus Christ was not God. Amen. The Bible tells us that anybody that, that, that calls Jesus accursed is not of God. Yeah. Right? And if they speak that Jesus is life, then they're not accursed. So don't let anybody tell you that Jesus Christ was, was not God. He was absolute God. And these are the scriptures that you need to have to show them the Bible very clearly declares that Jesus Christ was God. And so does Jesus Christ himself. He told his disciples, you know, they're like, oh, Lord, you know, just, just show us the Father. And if you'll show us the Father, we'll follow you anywhere. And he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Amen. I don't know of a better declaration. Yep. If you have seen me, then you have seen the Father who being the very, uh, very brightness of his glory and the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power. There's that word again. When he had by himself purged our sins, when he had by himself and the law purged our sins, see, that's what we tend to do. But that's not what it says. It says he did it by himself. There's no law involved. Okay? Most of us in here, uh, there may, I guess it's possible. No, I don't see any Jews in here. So that makes us Gentiles. That means we fall under Ephesians chapter 2. Right? We were far from God, had no hope. We were the children of disobedience. 
until Jesus Christ came and grace and truth. And when grace and truth came, then, but now, applies to us, we were drawn nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's very different. Upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and he sat down, why? His work was done. He's not getting back up on the cross for you. Wayne, you go out and sin tomorrow, he's not getting back on the cross for you. Your, your, your sins are forgiven from the moment you accepted Christ, Amen. from the moment you were born, Amen. to the moment you meet him face to face. If you can find something else in the Bible, please tell me. I'd be happy to look at it in Scripture. Your sins were forgiven once for all time. Amen? All right, and this is the last one. We really need to understand he had one purpose and one purpose alone. Oh, well, you know, he came, he really came to rebuke the Jews. No, he didn't. He came to die for them. He tells them over and over, read the Gospels. He tells, and, and, and listen, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the first seven, nine chapters of Acts, this is all still to the nation of Israel. The, the, the book of Acts is a very transitional book where we see Paul gets saved, and after Paul gets saved, then we see a calling of, of the Lord Jesus Christ to Paul to the Gentiles. Right? And even after that, the Bible tells us that Paul first went into every synagogue and every town he went into. He went to the Jews first and then out to the Gentiles. Paul was so in love with his brethren of the nation of Israel, he said, I wish that my name could be removed from the book of life, that the nation of Israel might be saved. Now that's a love for your people. So we need to remember that, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are very important because they tell us what Jesus Christ did and what happened when we hear scripture that talks about his rejection. He came to save. He was the Messiah. Israel had been waiting for a Messiah for thousands of years. And here he was in their very presence. But you know what? He wasn't like King Saul. He wasn't pretty and tall. He and just had manly. this oh, draw to him. The Bible says that he was of no great appearance. He just was a man. They were looking for a king. Their only desire for a king was to free them from Rome. And the Lord, oh, the Lord Jesus tells them over and over again, don't you know who I am? He was in their very presence. and they're trying. He was the word, and they were constantly trying to battle him with the scripture. He's like, I wrote the book. What are you talking about? And he tells them over and over again, you know, you, you're, you're, you're a whitened sepulcher. You're all pretty on the outside, but you're dead inside. They were all about outward appearance, but Jesus was all about inward. And do you know that the nation of Israel under the law of Moses, it was the same? God's purpose for the law was all about the inside. But when they took it, that became a show thing for them. It was all about their appearance of what they were doing. Very different from today. You know, we have to realize as believers, it's not about our outward appearance. It is about what the Lord has done with us and to us and for us on the inside. I would much rather be alive on the inside and dead on the outside than have, uh, uh, be accused of being very pretty on the outside in Christianity. Oh, he talks a good talk and he walks, you know, a good walk as far as we know. But the minute he gets home, you know, then the death pours out. You know, we have to be very careful of that. Love is a very important thing in the life of a believer. How many of us lose our temper? Anybody? Anybody lose their temper? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> right? Here's the truth of the matter. It's not about you losing your temper. It's about what happens in the moment that you lose your temper. Are you going to express Jesus Christ through the purest form of love? Are you going to express the flesh? And so for us, it always becomes an outward or an inward decision. If we're going to walk after the Spirit, we're going to have to decide to walk on the inward because the Holy Spirit lives where? He, where the Bible calls it we're indwelt, right? If you look at when the Lord Jesus himself was baptized, it says that he was immediately filled with the Holy Spirit and went out into the wilderness. Later on in John, it says that he was sealed. Sound familiar? Because that sealing doesn't happen again until Acts chapter 2. But the Lord Jesus himself, he not only had to be everything in order for the law to be fulfilled, he became everything for the Gentile believers who would in the future literally walk in the image of Jesus Christ being sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
was not an option for the Jews. God has done some wonderful things for us. And we need to remember, he had one purpose. His purpose, uh, look at verse uh, 18. Now that the birth of Jesus Christ was on, the why, on this wise, uh, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His whole purpose. The Bible declares his whole purpose was to save the world from their sins. His whole purpose was to reconcile us to God. Do you know in, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve decided, and we have to really remember that as believers, I promise you, you make decisions every day that determine whether you're walking in the flesh or walking after the spirit. And so that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They had everything. Everything was perfect. Don't forget the garden. There was no curse, no thorns, no thistles. They didn't have to work. Remember the, the curses came. There's a sweat of the brow. You mean Adam didn't sweat before then? Yes. The, the, the water, the, the whole earth was watered naturally from the firmament that God had put above, uh, uh, over the earth. No desert, no thorns, no thistles, no fear of animals being attacked or, or attacking or, you know, it was perfect. But Adam and Eve chose. And we have to really understand that. For us as believers, it really is a day-to-day, moment-to-moment, second-to-second, you are choosing whether to fulfill the things of the Spirit or to fulfill the things of the flesh. It's just realize that's where you're at as a believer in Jesus Christ. Am I talking about you're saved or lost? No, no, no. That's secured. It's done. That's finished. That's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. You're sealed until that day of redemption. It's eternal. But your day-to-day life, God equipped us to, to live here, to live now. And so that's the moment-to-moment decisions you're making. You will choose to walk after the flesh or choose to walk after the Spirit. And just like the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, chose to come down to earth and to save his people from their sins. Luke 1, 31 through 33. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke uh, 2, 10 through 11, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. One purpose. He had one purpose. Uh, John 1 29, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and declares the very purpose that Jesus Christ came to, whole, uh, came to earth. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, not, not covers, not what the law used to see. If you read Hebrews, uh, Hebrews describes what the law used to do when they did the sacrifices, is it, is it covered? Because they had to do it every year, right? Remember we talked about the scapegoat? They'd apply the, the blood to the scapegoat after it had been applied to the mercy seat, and then they'd release him into the wilderness. Well, what did they have to do the very next year? They had to do it all over again. But see, Jesus Christ didn't come to cover the sin. He came to remove our sin. A very different thing. He came for one purpose and one purpose only, to save his people, to redeem the lost to God. He came when Adam and Eve sinned, they were were right here with God. When they sinned, they caused a great gulf because God cannot be in the presence of sin. But God, in his infinite wisdom and his desire to have a relationship with mankind, made an oath to himself because there was none higher. And praise God, he removed us from that oath, yeah. unlike what he did with Moses, right? When Moses came down from, from the mountain, he showed the people the tablets, and they said, oh, we'll do all that is written therein. And God said, if you will, then I will. But you know what? That's not the case today. Because the law was completed in Jesus Christ. It was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And through Christ Jesus, not the law, but what? Grace and truth. So when, since we sit under grace and truth, once we accept that grace and truth and we believe the testimony that God has given of his son, the Bible says you have eternal life. That's all it takes. It's not about your actions. It's not about what you've done when you fall, when you make a mistake. It is about the fact you believe the testimony that God gave of his son. It is that simple. And so we rest in the fact that his one purpose 
was to cause a reconciliation between God and mankind. And in, in, in desiring that reconciliation, God came down in flesh. He took on flesh, suffered and died, and shed his precious blood, was buried and rose again the third day, according to 1 Corinthians. And through that, he had removed that distance or that gulf that used to be fixed between man and God. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, as Ephesians 2 says, you have been draw nigh or you have been drawn near. The Bible tells us over and over again that we have become heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We already read where it said that God has put all things under the Lord Jesus. Well, if I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ, what is mine? All things as a joint heir with Christ. Let's pray.